said we had Eloise's uh, uh, guest speaker come for Dare this year, and it's just been great getting to know you, Eloise, um, hearing more about your family, about your journey, about your passion, uh, and just about uh, what the Lord is doing through Eloise's life to not just impact her friends and um, her colleagues, her the athletes that she's around, her family members, but also really to touch the lives of of particularly families in northern Uganda. We're going to hear a little bit about her organisation, Love Mercy Foundation, and how she's, in one sense, stumbled upon this. And God gripped her heart with just a passion to do something to make a difference. This morning, we're starting a brand new series called Everyone Matters. When we see a crowd, we see a crowd. But when God sees a crowd, He sees every person. He sees every heart. He sees every struggle. And so this series is actually helping us to rediscover and reimagine what the gospel is <laughs> and how we can play our part in it. And so I'm so excited to begin this series and to start with hearing um, just from where Eloise is at and how the Lord's using her. So why don't we welcome her as she comes and shares this morning. How are you going? Great. Thank you. <laughs> Not feeling too exhausted? No, I feel good. I had a really good sleep. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. Just finding my questions. Give me one minute. Oh, good. <laughs> Talk amongst yourself. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, so you being at DARE, what was that like for you? And you don't, ha- I'm not paying you to say the right thing. <laughs> no, it was amazing. All of it was amazing. Oh, From um, the dinner on Friday night, I just love getting together and sharing a meal together and And just hearing some of the other um, women's stories, like I love hearing about other people's stories. I'm inspired by that. And obviously it was such an incredible privilege to share God's word and what I felt like he wanted me to encourage um, the girls with. And and then also speaking to the younger girls in the the panel um, section and um, just answering their questions and just seeing how, you know, they were just hungry to hear more about um, God and how to... I guess, grow closer to him and how to walk close with him. And yeah. Yeah. I was really impressed with their questions. I thought they might be yeah. a bit shy, but they were heaps excited were awesome. to ask you all the questions. That was fantastic. We had a special panel for girls who were under 21, just to be able to come and sit and hear some of Eloise's um, journey, but also pick her brain about how she de- has dealt with different challenges in her life. So that was really, really powerful. Cool. Um, well, we loved having you. It was really good. Tell us a little bit about your family. I believe you want to show us a bit of a picture. You've got a gorgeous little yeah, girl. Yeah, I've got, um, that's my husband and my little girl. And uh, yeah, there, Johnny is a um, photographer. He's been doing that for probably 20 years now. He started out following the surfing um, tour around and then um, that wasn't, it doesn't make that much money so he he wouldn't be able to support a family with that so he started his own business and started shooting weddings and and then he's also a nurse he's a nurse in um in the intensive care unit at a big hospital near us and you were sharing how but he's been such a uh, support and a partner with what God's called you to do and and as a family totally Um, yeah Yeah. do you want to just share a little bit about that I I, um shared a post that Eloise well, that her husband actually wrote about her because I was so touched about how he just shared about how proud he was of your de- determination and your courage, even mm. in the face of disappointment, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I get so emotional talking about him because, I, honestly, I couldn't have done anything of um, what I have in running without Johnny and, and in ministry as well. And, um, yeah, he's just that guy in the background that um, is happy to stay in the background and... Um, just make things happen and support me and um, yeah I know that there will come a time where that might switch um, because you know my running career will come to an end eventually and and our um, situation will change and there'll be times where he wants to um, you know follow other dreams as well and I'll be able to support him in that but for this time it's just been so incredible to have um, him just being that support for me and um, yeah, I mean, I've got this. I've got this great story about um, my favourite story about Johnny. This is just the kind of guy he is. He's really quiet, and um, 
and yeah, Mello is a surfer. And he, we went, um, my first Commonwealth Games in Melbourne in 2006, we, he came to watch me, um, my last track workout, and I was pretty nervous about it. And, um, but he didn't have a pass to get into the, the training track. And um, the security guard stopped him at the gate, and you know, and, he's, and Johnny was, you know, didn't argue about it. He's like, no worries, mate. And um, he's like, I see you after, you know, train well, babe, be praying for you. And um, I was running around, and I thought that I was dreaming it or something, but I just hear this, go, babe. <laughs> like, and I'm like, where is that coming from? Lap after lap, I'm just hearing, like, I'm, I thought it was him. I'm like, I can hear him cheering, where is he? Anyway, I finished um, one of the reps and I was in the recovery and I just looked and my coach was like pointing up and he's just up in the tallest tree outside <laughs> the stadium, sitting on this really sketchy branch and just up in the tree and I'm just like, you are so awesome. Can't get into the stadium, I'll climb a tree. I know, what a legend. I'll climb a tree and I was just sitting up there, go babe. Oh All mate, right, I want to meet you, he sounds cool. That's awesome. So um, what does life look like day by day for you? Some practical realities. I know you have to run a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I run between 20 and 30 kilometres a day when I'm in full training. Um, so it's usually spread into two different sessions, so in the morning and then the evening. So it's normally a pretty early morning for me and then um, I'll get home and get Indy ready for preschool and then take her to school and then I'll go to the gym and um, probably usually the physio and then pick her up from school. Um, and Johnny's office is at home, so um, when I go training, he can actually look after her when I go training again in the afternoon. And then we, Indy, we don't usually put Indy to bed until 9 p.m., but it just works for us. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's really good and, um, yeah, it's, so we can have dinner all together because I'm obviously out from... Um, I guess from 4.30 in the afternoon till about um, 6.30 or 7 and then get home and have dinner and yeah. do it all again the next day. That's good. I think adjusting and making it work as a family is so totally. important. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So um, just thinking about a question that I actually really want to know. I heard a little bit about it, but how are you awakened to knowing God personally? Like, was there someone who was a good friend to you, like I was talking about, who invited you to church mm -hmm. or... Um, yeah, how did you actually get to know Christ? Yeah, so um, I was at school and it, it actually happened um, just after I missed out of my first Olympics. So um, I had an injury that forced me out of the Sydney Olympics and um, I was really devastated and down and I kind of isolated myself from all of my friends. I didn't want to talk to anyone and, um, and I just remember sitting on my own at lunchtime at school. So I was 16 years old. I'd... Um, just missed out on my um, Olympic dream, I guess, and um, and yeah, I was back at school, and yeah, and this um, new girl to our school, she came over to me and she said, um, I, I heard about what happened to, with your injury, and um, I just want you to know that I've been praying for you, and I've got some friends from church that are praying for you, and um, I'm just believing that God's got a great plan for your life, and everything's going to work out for you, and um yeah, until that point, I, you know, I went to church every Sunday with my family, but I still had a really warped sense of who God was. I thought that he was this huge being in the sky that was going to strike me down if I did something wrong. And I actually thought that because I was injured, he was punishing me for something that I'd done wrong. And yeah, I went to church with my new friend Lisa and heard the gospel and heard about Jesus and heard you know, about how he has numbered the hairs on our head and that he cares about the intricate details and that he wants a relationship with us and that he died for me and for us and for everybody and um, yeah so I've received Jesus when I was 16 and I never looked back and the thing I love about that too is that Lisa she, she had actually been kicked out of a Christian school um, and yeah for being rebellious and and that's why we got along because we were like <laughs> totally rebellious. We had a common thing and, going on. Um, yeah and I just love that God you know, used her, you know, she, that it didn't matter that people didn't, th other people didn't think that, you know, she was good enough to be a certain way, to be a Christian, but God used her. And then I watched her um, minister to other people as well, minister to other people in our year grade, and and still um, today she is has such an evangelistic gift on her life, so yeah. Don't you love hearing about the leases? 
I love hearing about people who you wouldn't know their story except for talking to you, but like, that's so awesome that she just decided to have compassion and be a good friend and let that out of that overflow of her life just come and say, you know, just say something about God and how she how was feeling for you. That was just beautiful. Yeah. Um, tell us about some significant milestones in your running career so far. There's been, I know we talk about some of the challenges, but what's been some milestones? And I know it's not easy talking about yourself sometimes, but... Yeah, um... I think um, making the London Olympics was probably, I think we have a shot of, uh, um, that was the starting line of the 10,000 metres at the London Olympics and I saw, <laughs> I saw my family up in the stands um, and it was obviously a really emotional moment, still touches me evidently um, and yeah, I think, um, you know, after 19 years of struggle and pain and being injured so much and missing out on three previous Olympics, that was a really special moment. And just seeing them in amongst 90,000 people, <laughs> like, going crazy and whacking people over the head with the Australian flag, like, <laughs> waving it too furiously. Um, but just knowing that they had been there with me along the entire journey and they, um, you know, like cheered me on when I wanted to give up and encouraged me and, and um, yeah, that was a really special moment. That's really beautiful. Mm. Um, I know that you've been in two Olympics so far and you're aiming for is it Beijing? Tokyo. Tokyo, hello. Yeah. I'm really <laughs> knowledgeable about sport. There we go. <laughs> Tokyo, thank you. But... Um, what about some significant setbacks? I mean, we heard you share really vulnerably about that at Dare. Mm -hmm. There's been significant setbacks. Do yeah. you, you had a dream when you were a little girl mm. about joining, being part of the Olympic team. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about what's been, what happened along the way. Yeah, so um, like the dream started when I was 10 years old. I was watching the Barcelona Olympics on television and I was watching the women's distance running events go around and that's what I was passionate about. I started running when I was five. My mum was a good runner and um, I was just really passionate about running. I actually wasn't that good at it. I wasn't a standout at, at five years old or even 10 years old, but I just loved it. I always loved to run. And um, yeah, I was watching the Olympics and I just remember going, I turned to my mum and dad and like, I'm gonna do that one day. And um, they say when you said that, do you remember? Uh, just, yeah, go on. <laughs> like, my, my mum and dad are like the most encouraging people, and, um, and frustratingly so. In that, if I even like, if I run a bad race and I know about it, then my mum will go, That was great. And I'll be like, That was the worst race of my life, mum. She's like, Yeah, but you tried. <laughs> um, but yeah, and so from that moment, it just became a childhood obsession. And I, um, yeah, but at age 13, I um, struggled with an eating disorder and um, that kind of escalated and, and really kind of gripped um, who I was and, and my health declined. And despite this, I was still training really hard um, to try and make the next Olympics, which was gonna be in the, in the year 2000 in Sydney. And I was 16 years old um, and I qualified for the Sydney Olympics and just um, three weeks later, I was, I was measured for the uniform and selected for the shadow team. And um, three weeks later, I suffered that first injury. And, um, but that's, you know, that's how, um, God drew me to himself, you know, I was, I was drawn to my knees in that moment and, um, and that's, that was kind of the pivotal moment of me finding Jesus. So, you know, I wouldn't regret any of my injuries. I still, and when I came to know Jesus, like life didn't all of a sudden get super peachy, you know, but I had this foundation, I had this newfound hope and I had this, um, I, I knew who I was and, you know, I was on this journey of discovering um, you know, the hope that we have in, in Christ and, um, and more and more of his love and his love for humanity. Yeah. And so, yeah, and I guess, you know, along the way, there's more and more stress fractures. I still had another 10 stress fractures. I had to overcome my eating disorder. I had to, God really challenged me about that early on. 
about transforming my thoughts and, and because that's, you know, essentially it's a mental illness, so you need to transform your thoughts in order to start going in the right direction because your thoughts, um, you know, your thoughts, um, yeah, are distorted and they, they control your actions. And so you're either going this way with your thoughts or you're going this way. And um, I needed to, to catch my thoughts and think about what I was thinking about and, and think about what was destructive and think about what was the lies and, and, and catch them and go, no, go back to God's word. And this is what he says about me, that I am enough, that I'm worthy of being nourished, that I'm worthy of being fed and that I don't have to exercise for eight hours a day to have lunch. And, you know, like it, I just had to start challenging myself on a daily basis to overcome. Yeah. And um, it took six years. It took a long time, but um, it felt like a long time. But God was so gentle. Yeah. He was so gentle yeah. and patient. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, like, honestly, I could, I don't think um, it would have been possible without the love and the, the help of God to walk through that. And, um I, had the, I was diagnosed with the bone density of an 85-year-old woman when I was 16 years old and um, because of the eating disorder. And, uh, yeah, by the time I lined up at the Olympics, um, my bone density was above normal, what it would be for a normal person. So that was, um, that was just a great testimony, I guess, and despite what the doctors had said. And, um, and yeah, and just, I guess... Um, the flow-on effect of, of being injured. I wouldn't take any of my injuries away or any of my setbacks away, even though they were really, um, they were really hard at the time. And there was a lot of times that I wanted to give up, and uh, I was questioning God's sovereignty over my Olympic dream, and, and questioning whether it was actually for Him. Questioning whether I was in the right sport. <laughs> you know, after your tenth stress fracture, you go, "Am I?" Should I be a runner? <laughs> um, and, but I was passionate about it. I'm passionate about it. And I think, and God gives us our desires. He gives us our passions. He can't deny that. And I could never deny that. And even though I was going through, even though running was kind of causing the pain, when eventually my injuries healed, get running again, you just find that passion for it again. And then the Olympic dream was still this light in the back of my head going, still here, flickering <laughs> away, you know. Actually, as you're talking, it reminds me of that scripture. It says, a bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he won't snuff out. Just the gentleness of God and how he led you through faithfully and just patiently. Um, and you were saying last night too, when a bone heals after a fracture that it's stronger? Yeah, so recent um, medical research is, um, has suggested that after, after a stress fracture, the bone actually calcifies and it fortifies stronger than it was before the break. And I think that that's such, a, um, yeah, it's such an awesome picture of how our challenges can actually make us so much stronger yeah. and give us an opportunity to grow and, and strengthen us. Especially your faith, I think the resilience and faith and determination you God had to build in you mm. was like is, has just been very evident. Looking, I'm sure in it it was horrible, <laughs> but looking back, you can just see it. It's um, in you and flows through you now in what you're doing. So I can see that it's really come out of the fruit of that difficult time. It's awesome. Um, how you talked about God called you to run you really felt like that was a dream and a passion he put in you but how did love mercy foundation come about and how did jesus actually get your attention about the need in uganda it was actually quite a divine appointment that he set up which didn't yeah. look like it at the time <laughs> no it was, uh, um, didn't i uh so i i missed two olympics sydney and athens um was measured for the uniform for both of those and it again went went to try and make beijing in 2008 this would be my third Olympics that I go for, and I was I was ready, you know. I was I, I dreamed of writing a book one day, and I'd already coined the the title to this chapter. It was going to be called "Slow Boat to China," because it was, <laughs> it was the, the Olympics were in Beijing. But I um and again I was I was measured for the uniform and selected in the shadow team, and and I got another stress fracture. And at this point, I I wanted to give up. I remember saying to my husband, "I'm done with this sport." 
Um, I, I just can't do it anymore. It's just too much of a roller coaster ride. And he just encouraged me. He said, oh, whatever you want to do, like, I'll support you. And um, I got this uh, call from my coach, and he said I had this opportunity to go to Portland um, and try and rehab my foot in, in time for the Olympics. The, the, the Olympics were 12 weeks away. And uh, he said, there's a special treadmill over there um, that they built for NASA. It's the only one in the world. At, uh, it was the only one in the world at the time. And um, you've been invited over there to try and rehab your foot. And it, uh, as soon as he asked me, I said no. I just, I didn't want to try anymore. I didn't want to risk failing again. And so, um, but we, we, we talked about it and we prayed about it for a day and, and we just decided that I'd go. And I still got on the plane really negative about my situation. Even when I got to Portland, I was still on crutches and I'm just going, God, how is this going to work out? Like, are you even in this? You know, are you, are you in this? And, um, and then I met Julius. Um, he's a Ugandan runner from, from um, Uganda. And... Um, and he was living in Portland, and we were staying at the same house, and we were sponsored by Nike at the time, and Nike have this house in, in Portland that international athletes can base from and train from, and he was staying there, and he was working as a pacemaker uh, or a trainer for some of the American athletes, the top American athletes, and getting paid by Nike to do that. And uh, the day I met Julius was the day that I got to Portland, and he said to me, how's your foot? And I said to him, I was, I was really open with him. I said, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. And this would be, if I miss this Olympics, it would be the third one that I'll miss. I was giving him this, this whole woe is me story. And he said, if, if I tell you my story, then your foot problem would become very small. And he began to tell me his story of being born into poverty in northern Uganda and at age 11, he was captured by rebel soldiers and held at a rebel camp for three months. And um, actually, we're going to watch the video. Yeah, we can, we can throw the video um, of Julius's story. Yeah. Thanks.
you that if you have the help, the family to take care of their children, giving them education, the kids are benefiting so much. Uh, the third program, Child Sponsorship, which is a sponsor of our foster kids. At the beginning, we began with the original 11 kids, which are found in 2003. We give them now sponsorship to their school. Most of these kids now they are in high school. We keep their land so much. That um, little boy that J uh, Julius was chasing there, he was one of the original 11 orphans that Julius found underneath a bus um, in the height of the war. And he was so young that he didn't actually um, even know his own name. And so Julius named him after himself. So that's Mini Julius. <laughs> Mini Julius. <laughs> Mini me Julius. That's yeah. fantastic. Um, when have you been, obviously... When obviously all the time you're reminded that everyone matters. <laughs> um, I know I follow the posts that you do for Love Mercy on Instagram, and you're often sharing women's stories, yeah. just about how the Sense for Seed loan has made such a difference in their life. And mm. I remember one of the um, the ladies says, "My life matters. Mm. My life is important." And that really touched me because I thought, "Wow, someone actually giving her the tools to be able to feed her family and to be able to help." Um, you know, educate her children, you know, just to know that she can then do something about that was mm. really powerful. So is there another story or something you wanted to share about one, like the one, you know, because all, all it's amazing when you think of the scope of what you're doing because I know there's 13,800 women in the Sense for Seeds program now and you've got a goal to, to have 20,000 by 2020. Yes. Receiving these loans, growing in the fertile field and then reaping a crop and selling it and using the money to help them. So is there another, is there one story that you can think of that? Oh uh, yeah, the one that uh, I guess comes to mind straight away is um, this uh, woman that I met. Actually, I was out on a run, her name is Margaret, and I was out on a run one morning in Uganda, and Julius was actually meant to be with me, but I, I dropped by his house, and we do this funny thing where I'll whistle a couple of times, and he'll get out of bed and get dressed, and come but I whistled for about 20 minutes and I was just getting just absolutely eaten by mosquitoes so I just left um, and he slept in so I um, yeah was running alone and uh, this woman was I, I just sensed this woman uh, was or somebody was riding their bike next to me and it was one of those awkward things where she wasn't going faster than me and I wasn't going faster than her we were kind of riding and she was like on this side and I'm on this side and and then we ended up just, I ended up just going, morning. <laughs> and, um, and I said, where have you come from? And she said, uh, I'm going back to my village in Abaco. And she was riding about 15 kilometres back to her village. And um, she shared with me that she had been in town. And I said, what were you doing in town? And um, she said, I was there to buy seeds. And I looked on the back of her bike and, and I said, well, where, where are your seeds? And she said, oh, um, I, I, 
they were too expensive and uh, could not afford and so she was going home um, with no seeds and with um, she's and I said do you have children and she said I have three children and um, and I, I told her about sense for seeds and I said um, do you think that this is something that your village um, would be a part of and she said yes uh, the, many people are starving in my village and Abako is um, kind of out a little bit further from Awake where we started Sense for Seeds. So the, the whole idea is that we would start in Awake and kind of spread out um, and I guess like, you know, expand um, from there in the north and into different villages that would, imp um, that Sense for Seeds would have an impact. And yeah, I, I just, I had this conversation with Margaret and I just I, I never forgot her and I just thought as soon as you know it just became this goal that as soon as we had um, enough uh, I guess resources and funds that we would move into a barco and we needed a certain amount of money we, we checked out um, the village and definitely it was definitely a village that would um, that we would do sense for seeds in because it would have such an incredible impact um, on the lives of the community there and um, we found out how many people were in the community and we found out how much money it would take to um, get the whole community involved in Sense for Seeds because we, we don't want to go in and go, we're just going to, we can only do it with a hundred, you know, we can only do it with a hundred and it's just really hard to decide who is going to be able to do it and who's not. So we, we really wanted to go in and just go, hey, we've got the resources for everyone to participate everyone matters and um and we needed twenty thousand dollars and um and yeah sure enough we we started we just started praying about it and praying about this amount that we needed and and we got this email um from a friend of mine or an, an athlete who i went to the commonwealth games with in 2006 so i'm talking from 2006 until 2015 um, I hadn't seen this athlete and she sent us a random email. She said, hey, my, my mum and dad um, are farmers and they're really interested in what you're doing and we'd like to give a significant donation and the amount is $20,000. Wow. And, and, and we'd love, and, and this was her, we didn't, even, we didn't even tell her about the village and, and she said, we, it, do you think we'd be able to sponsor a whole village with your program with that? <laughs> like, yes. Yeah, so we moved into Abaco um, a couple of years ago and um, it's one of the villages that we've actually um, done our wellbeing study. So we partnered with a, a company last year called Huber Social, an organisation that actually measure the impact of, of, um, of organisations and, and their programs in developing countries and just seeing what the actual impact. We knew that it was working but we wanted someone from, um, I guess, an unbiased, to get an unbiased view of, of how um, the program was working. So we interviewed, we surveyed 1,200 women in the program to get a, a scale, a score of, of well-being. And um, some of the women were, had been in the program for one year and some of the, pro um, the women had been in for four years and um, others hadn't started yet. And the level, um, the level of well-being of a woman who had been in the program for four years was far greater than a woman who had been in the program for one year. And so we know that the program is working and um, we ask questions like that, you know, do, um, uh, and there's, there's actual things from the program that we didn't realise would happen. We believe that it's reducing domestic violence because the, the woman is being seen, um, because the woman receives the loan and then does the farming, which is culturally um, how it works in Uganda. Um, and the man is seeing that the woman is, you know, she's providing and she's providing for the family. And, and so it's reducing domestic violence in that way. And we had no idea that things like that would happen. And um, yeah, so that's another point of impact. I'd love you to finish by, you, sh you told us a story yesterday about your brother. Yeah. And I'd love you to share that story again, if that's okay, because I just think it really shows the power of um, not just being a good friend, but being, being um, showing the kindness of God and showing that an individual matters, demonstrating that and, and partnering with what the Holy Spirit wants to do in drawing people to him. Mm. Tell us a bit about your brother. Uh, my brother. Um, so, 
when we were young adults, even when we were kids and then moving into young adults, my, my brother, I'm one of four, but I, and I get along, I, I got along with my, my younger brother and my older sister, but my older brother and I just really clashed. And we, um, it wasn't like this, it wasn't your typical brotherly, sisterly bickering. We, we legitimately couldn't stand to be around each other. And um, I, I genuinely thought that he was the devil. And... Um, <laughs> And, you know, I was 16 and he was 18 and we just, we just fought all the time. We really disliked each other. And, um, and then I got saved. And, um, and soon after this, Ben, my brother, he was the first person that God put on my heart to, to love more and, and, to, and to, to be kind to. And, and I, was just, I, I just started asking God, well, you're going to have to show me how because... He's, he's a really hard guy to love. And um, so I just, I just started doing things for him. I started washing his car and making his lunch. And he loved it, but he, he didn't reciprocate the kindness. <laughs> but he, he loved it, and he started to trust me. He started to trust me, and I started to ask him to church. And at first he was like, nah, go away. <laughs> no way. Get lost. And, um, but I kept asking him. I kept doing these kind things for him. And it was hard because... Sometimes he would still resemble the devil, <laughs> you know, he, he, was, he, he would be mean and it was really hard to love him, um, but I just kept asking God for the grace and to help me keep loving him and um, yeah, I just asked him to church again and I ended up just saying one day, you know, it's not like the church um, that you think, you know, this is, this is cool, this is like, there's a band and there's music and and um, the, the lead singer of the music team is, I'm pretty sure you'd think she was a mega babe. <laughs> and, and that totally won him. And he's like, all right. And so he came along the very next Sunday and, um, and he heard the gospel like he'd never heard it before. And he received Jesus. And my brother is 38 years old now. He's one of my best friends and he's my biggest cheerleader. And he's, um, he's planted in the house of God. And he married the lead singer of the music team. <laughs> Some of you want to try that strategy, but just be careful, all right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, they have three beautiful children who love Jesus and who now minister to my little girl and show her what it is to love God. And I love that God... The first person that, um, when I came to know Jesus, the first person that God asked me to love was someone who was really hard to love, you know? And it, challenged me, it challenges me still today that, you know, who else do I need to, to love more? Who else is hard to love in my life? Who else do I need grace for? And, um, yeah, I, I love that, that the generational influence now of that, testimony of God's goodness and his grace will be felt in my brother's kids and now in my child and um yeah it's amazing everyone matters and so I just love that story about Ben because I think um it just shows how the Lord is always wanting to move upon our hearts to reach those that he's placed right around us I mean some of us he's called to go and have an impact in other countries or pray or go, give or go but just the fact that God used you to have an impact in your, in your brother's life and to have such a love and a compassion for him, I think, just shows that that's what God, God wants to do with each one of us. Each one of us have got people in our life that don't know Jesus right now, who don't have a relationship with him. And he wants each one of us to be filled up with the love of God, to extend a hand, to reach out, to do kind things to have boldness to invite them along to church or to Alpha or to share about what Jesus has done in our life. So thank you for modelling that for us, Eloise, and sharing that story. Can we put our hands together for Eloise? I actually want to read you a quote from the book by Pastor Ian Miller that um, we've been looking... Well, it's available if you wanted to purchase it, but it's something that we've been really looking at in our small groups as a focus over August and are looking at on here am I or here I am, send me. And it's all about rediscovering the gospel. And so this whole series that we've been doing 
has been um, bringing us back to the heart of the gospel that God is interested in everyone. You know, it says in Luke 19.10, it says that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He came to seek, he came to woo, to, to find them, even when they're hard to love <laughs> people, and to actually, he died for them and he came to win them to Christ. And so that we can be partner, we can be caught up in you, being used by God to do that. Um, and the other one is, I was thinking about that story Jesus told in Luke 15 when he said, which one of you, if you had 100 sheep? Now, I've never owned 100 sheep, right? So this is hard to picture. Does anyone, David Hersey, do you own sheep still? Where is he? Yes, he does. All right. So if you, just, just I'm just going to shout it out to you from here. If you lost a sheep, would you go and find it? Okay. Because the sheep, like to, a, to, a, to someone who owns sheep, a lost sheep is, is valuable. Like it's either providing wool or it's sometimes a pet. Sometimes it provides nice yummy lamb chops. Sorry. But, but if you own 100 sheep and you lost one, you deliberately and intentionally go and look for the one that was lost. And so I think for this series, we are just trying to come back in to align our hearts with God's heart that he is always on the lookout, always on the lookout for the one who is lost. And our understanding of the word lost can be a bit distorted. So I just want to read you a passage from what, uh, just a passage from the book that Pastor Ian Miller has written and have a listen to this. Lost in the general way that I use the word means misplaced. I might have misplaced my car keys, but if I look, I'll find them for sure. <laughs> They're not gone. But that is not what Jesus means when he calls your friends or family members or neighbours lost. They are lost, destroyed. They are goners. They are not misplaced, wandering around comfortable in a tourist city of Europe. They are perishing. To be honest, I do not think we realise this. The people around us are not merely missing, as if the invitation went out for the family to come together at mealtime and one of the seats was empty. One of the family is missing and we think that everything is okay. They just need some time and they'll get to the table. They will not miss out. But that is not how Jesus views the empty seat. He weeps over it because the person who is not there is perishing, destroyed. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. There's an urgency about the gospel when you discover that people are destroyed without Jesus. And it makes you understand why there is a party in heaven every time a sinner returns home. And I just share that with us because I have been challenged and we want to be continually aligned to God's heart. And this, we never graduate from this. This is the heart of God. This is what he came for, to seek and save the lost. And many of us have experienced his personal salvation. We enjoy the blessings of it. But we cannot, we must not. <laughs> Scripture urges us, Jesus tells us for his mission of why he came, that he's given us authority to preach and share the good news, to share the good news. And so are you sharing the good news? Is there an overflow coming out of your life where you just see people and you think, all right, Lord, I'm open for what you want to do. How do you want me to just love them and see them with your eyes? How can I be kind to them? Like Eloise said, How, give me strategies, give me ideas, give me ways that I can minister to them and show them that you are loving and you are good and that you are a God who doesn't point the angry finger at them, but you have come so that they could have a relationship with you. It's not just for the evangelists and the people who we think are really good at sharing their faith story. It's for the Jessicas <laughs> who shared with Eloise, who had the guts to say, come up to her and say, I'm praying for you. You know, it's not just for the, the people who are up front. It's for the people who are the behind the scenes, the Jonos who climb the tree when they can't get into the stadium <laughs> to find a way to cheer someone or find a way to be able to share our faith. So God is calling us, church, to renew our commitment to what he is about and what his heart is about. Can we stand together? <laughs>